morning. My name is Pastor Freddie Elsa, Living Word Ministry here in West Harold, Indiana. I hope you're having a beautiful day and I hope the Lord is blessing your life. Things are going well with you. Today I would like to bring a teaching on creation. Now this is a very controversial issue and a lot of people are seem to be fighting over things in the Bible about creation and some people are confused in many areas. And yet, then there's many who are trying to teach evolution, which I don't believe is God at all. I don't believe that we evolved. I believe that we were created by divine beings. Amen. But anyway, let's start teaching here and start reading in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, I'd like to pause there for a minute, I know, before I even take off here. In the beginning, God. So what was in the very beginning? God. Before anything was, God. There was no beginning with God. He is eternal and everlasting. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Praise God. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now that is rendered in the original Greek and Hebrew heavens because God created heavens, plural. In other words, the atmospheric heavens. And the other second heaven, which is the stars and the planets and all that, then of course the third heaven where God is. Amen. Now, in verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, right here again, I would like to discuss this a little bit. This is what's called by theologians a gap theory, between verse 1 and verse 2. I don't believe in theories, but I do see there is a time period between these two verses. In other words, God did not create the earth void, form, without form, and empty, and useless. God does not do things like that. I'm going to use some Greek and Hebrew words that I believe will help you. First of all, the word bara, B-A-R-A, Hebrew word, meaning to create from nothing. In other words, God spoke into existence the universe and the planets and stars and the earth all this into existence in the very beginning then the word arche a-r-c-h-e that e has a little slash over it pronounce it as arche means dateless past or eternity in other words we don't know what how much time is involved there and yet a lot of people are like I said, arguing this subject, you have what we call young earth creationists who believe that everything was created in 6,000 years. Well, the Bible definitely bears that out to be wrong. And good science would also prove that wrong. Because there's evidence through fossils and through uh, carbon dating and all of this now, the age of things. Even charts are over 400 million years old. So how does that fit with 6,000 years? It doesn't. But anyway, I'm not here to argue this fact, but just to teach and show what the scriptures actually say. But this will take a little bit of time, so be patient with me and endure, if you will. And keep an open heart and mind and read God's word. I believe God's word, not man's. There are people, theologians, who want to teach what they believe they see here in the scriptures. But actually, from verse 3 on, is another word, which is asah, A-S-A-H, means to restore or recreate. In other words, God was recreating the earth and all of this from the elements that he had already originally created in verse 1. I hope I haven't lost you, and I'm uh, right on with you here, and you're understanding what I'm saying. All right, so anyway, God made the earth perfect very first stage of the earth, the new earth, was absolutely perfect. And also, I'm going to show you that there were a race of people on the earth before Adam, called pre-Adamites. A lot of people have trouble with that because they don't believe that, but it's right here in the scriptures. So it can be proved. Sadly, uh, you know, people were taught all of this in Sunday school about creation, but they weren't taught correctly. The Bible. Alright, so now.
now I would like to turn to Isaiah chapter 45. Now, right here, we're in verse 2 again, backing up where I turned there, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So we're going to turn to Isaiah 45. First, we're going to Isaiah 24. Sorry about that. Isaiah 24. Did I get there? Like I said, you have to bear with me here. It's a lot of page turning to scripture. Isaiah 24 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants of it. Now, right away, the young earth creationists would use that scripture and say that shows right there that the Lord uh, destroyed the earth. But the Lord actually didn't. It was, uh, there was war in heaven with Lucifer, the greatest archangel that God ever created. And he was cast out of heaven, and he landed on earth. And Satan is the destroyer. He's the one that perverted the earth. And God cursed the luminaries and cursed the stars the moon and all that so they wouldn't shine. And we're going to see a swaddling band that went around the earth which caused darkness and, and uh, darkness upon the deep. Now if you jump down to verse 3 here it says the land shall be utterly empty and utterly spoiled for the Lord has spoken this word. You notice the word utterly there. In other words absolutely useless, void, and empty. Now in the second flood when God <clears throat> destroyed the earth not everything was destroyed. The vegetation was still there. The moon was still there. The stars and the light and all of that. But in the first destruction, everything was absolutely, utterly destroyed. Amen. All right, now let's turn over to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself and formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. Notice that. See the word vain? God never creates anything vain, empty, void, useless. So verse 2 is not the creation of the earth. It was not in that condition. God created it absolutely perfect. It was seed time and harvest. All that was going on. But Lucifer rebelled against God. You can find that in Isaiah chapter 4. Ezekiel chapter 28. You can't go into all that today, but you can you read those chapters in there. You'll find where he rebelled against God, and God cast him out of heaven as profane. You can find that over in Revelation chapter 12. All right. He formed it to be inhabited. In other words, he didn't create it in vain. Notice, he formed it to be inhabited. Could the earth be inhabited in verse 2? No. It was completely void, empty, darkness was up on the face of the deep. And we see the Holy Spirit moving up on the earth and brooding over the waters. Here is where God is beginning to recreate what he had already created. Now, we don't know the age time limit there or whatever that involved. But this is God moving back upon the earth to recreate everything. All right, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoke, uh, spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. See that? I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. God is a creator of good and perfect and goodness, not bad things. God doesn't create bad things. Now, I know there's a scripture that says he creates darkness and he created evil. But actually, God created Lucifer, and Lucifer fell because pride was inside of him, and darkness and sin was, and iniquity was found in him. Therefore, he fell from the presence of the Lord because he wouldn't obey the Lord. He was an evil demon. He wouldn't follow God. He wanted to be God. So, now, when Jesus came into the earth, Satan didn't know who he was at first. He seen this man. But, you know, if you read in Matthew chapter 4, it said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. He kept saying to Jesus, If, if, if. Satan is always if. So 
the what is. That's the way he operates. But God is positive and right on target. The Lord says, light be, let there be light, and there was. He said, God said it's good. He creates all things that are good. Amen. Now let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 4. Before we, before we go there, though, and Ken, I would like to read another scripture here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, that deals with what we were just talking about. Now verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 11. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. That proves what I said a minute ago, that God spoke everything into existence. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, they were made from nothing. Now evolutionists try to preach that envelope, but they preach it the wrong way. But God is able to speak things into existence. Also in Hebrews it says, calling those things that be not as though they were. In other words, by faith we speak, therefore it manifests into existence. God spoke, and the planets and the, the moon and stars came into existence. Because he spoke them into existence. Amen. But I told you in verse 3 on, God recreated from existing uh, materials and things that he had previously had created from. In the first place, in verse 1, I'm going to be All right. Now, but it says through faith, understand, see the word understand, that the worlds, plural, world, that means planets, stars, other universes, all these galaxies that come into existence, because God framed them by his word. Alright, now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4. Praise God. I hope you're getting something from this. I'm trying to explain this as simply as I can. It's really time consuming, but I don't have a lot of time here to squeeze it all in here. So we're going to do our best. Amen. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 4, he says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form. Now that's this is proven verse 2 again. So he's looking at the situation. The Lord is showing Jeremiah the earth in this condition. And void, and the heavens, they had no light. Wait a minute, they had no light. So that proves what I said, that God cursed the illuminaries. And I call them luminaries because that's what they are. The moon reflects the light of the sun, but the sun produces light itself because it is a burning gas, all of gases, very hot, very hot, millions of degrees in the center, very millions of degrees on the surface of it as well. Okay, he said, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. And I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, see that? No man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities, see that? There were there cities there. I'm talking about before Adam here. Therefore, were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his spirit and anger. Now, these are people also that displeased God. They had joined up with Lucifer and began to follow after him. We go over to Genesis 6 and we read where the angels left their first estate and had sex with women and created what is called Nephilim or giants. Now this is all in the Bible. I'm not giving you fairy tales here. These things actually are true. So these are angels fell from their first estate because they became into the likeness of a man and therefore had sexual intercourse with women and produced these giants. And some of these had six fingers on each hand, six toes, two rows of teeth. They were weird and strange. They're very big and very strong. So they begin to dominate the earth with the evil. That's why God had to destroy it. God destroyed it actually twice. The first time was Lucifer when he rebelled. And the second time when he told Noah to build the ark because he had to destroy all flesh because all flesh is continually wicked and evil. Every thought and intent of man's heart 
Again, I beheld and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled, gone. No birds, no birds left. Now, in Noah's flood, there were birds that were still flying around, and there was a dove, and also a raven on the ark. God sent them out. I mean, Noah sent them out to see if they could find any vegetation, to see if the waters had abated. I want to deal with that too. So when we get to the scripture here, we'll see something. Through the place of the wilderness and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus has the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate. Look at that. Desolate. Absolutely desolate. Yet will I not make a full end. In Noah's flood, God didn't make a full end. The vegetation, even under the water, and everything was still alive. Fish were still there, but in the first destruction, there was no fish. There was nothing left alive on the planet. All right, verse twenty-eight. So this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black. See, there it is. Because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and I will not repent. Neither will I turn back from it. That's what the Lord is saying right there. Said, "I'll make a full end." But then the Lord begins to reconstruct and recreate ages later. We don't know, like I said, that time period, verse 1, verse 2. We just don't know how long that period of time is. Yet people like to speculate. Like I said, the young earth creationists like to push the 6,000 year formula and believe that's what the Bible means. But it doesn't match, it doesn't match technology and science today. And God has allowed technology and everything to increase and knowledge to increase like the angel. He said that the last days knowledge shall increase, men shall run to and fro. In other words, it's going to keep on increasing. And they say now that uh, knowledge and technology is increasing, doubling every two years. That's a lot, folks. So we have when we teach the word, we have to be accurate with the word. We can't teach some Take the Bible and turn it into a fairy tale, and that's exactly what people are trying to say it is. But the Bible speaks exactly the truth of God. And God knows exactly what He wants to say to man, but a lot of times man can understand what He reads. A lot of people read into this Bible what, he, what they want it to say. And I am not doing that, my dear friend. I'm reading these scriptures right here. You can either take them at face value or whatever you want. That's the way I look at it, and I, I look at the way what God says. All right, I'd like to turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to deal with some things here as well. 2 Peter chapter 3. All right, we'll start with verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts. So these are the people off against the word of God and say, you know, everything's still the same, nothing's changed, it all remains the same. And you people preach the same thing all the time. But we don't. Things are changing rapidly. Prophecies are being fulfilled so fast now that we can't even keep up with it. These wars that are going on over the Middle East, the stage is set, Christ is about to return. Things are popping and moving. People better pay attention to what the Christians are saying, at least the ones that know what they're talking about in the word of God. Now, knowing this first, that there shall come the last days of offering, walking after their lot and lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Do they really? No. No, they don't. And again, they're trying to speak of the original creation. They don't even know that they're saying that, but that's exactly what it is. Things are a whole lot different than they were from the very beginning. God created the earth absolutely perfect and no flaws with it. Now, verse 5, for this, 
they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God heavens were of old and the earth standing here it is out of the water and in the water. Now right there is where the young earth creation is trying to say that's Noah's blood. No, it's talking about the first blood. Out of the water and then in the water. The earth is completely engulfed with water and you know, darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly deeds. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And there again is the young earth creation to come in and try to say it's six thousand years like one day. They're calling it a twenty four hour day and they're calling it thousand years. Now, that could be so in the recreation that God is not talking about the original creation. Now, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his own suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's why this fire and heat is, is, is storage right now for the destruction of the face of the earth again. God is going to renovate again one day. So where are we going to be? If we the saints will be with him, I imagine. I don't know. God has a way of taking us off the planet when he renovates it. See, the word is restore again as Sodom, not Barak. He's not going to create absolutely a new heaven and new earth. He's going to redo it all after the burn of the atmosphere, all of that, the planet, all that stuff is going to be scorched because of the demon spirits and everything has to be removed and out. That's when they will be cast into the lake of fire. That's very now verse 11 says, Seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, what manner person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. And verse 14 says, Therefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of this peace without spot and blameless. All right. Now I want to turn back here to Job chapter 38. Job 38. And we're going to deal with this a little bit further here. By the way, I want to say this, that the angels were created long before the earth and plants and all that. They, they all rejoice at the creation of the earth. In other words, the angels, we don't even know what age they are, but they are numerous too. There's so many of them. And yet, one third of them fell with Lucifer when he rebelled against God and was rejected from heaven. They went with him. And these were the angels that were working with Lucifer before his fall was ruling over the race of the people that were on the earth and administration and all of that. But they also fell with Lucifer because Lucifer deceived them as well. Now, Job 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkness counsel by words without knowledge? He's talking about those that were comforting Job, so-called comforters. Bildad, Zophar, these others that didn't know what they were talking about. And even including Job. Because man has his own ideas and ways. Proverbs 14 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the ways of the end thereof is death. So what you think maybe is right could be what? Dead wrong. We have to base what we believe with the Word of God. If we don't believe, with the word of God, then what are we believe? We believe about anything. I've heard this whole thing, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. 
Well, I stand for the Word of God. And I believe God. The Bible says it's better to believe God than to believe man. Let God be the truth and every man the liar. God's Word is truth and it doesn't lie. So therefore I stay with the Word of God. That's what I teach. I don't teach any theology of my own or any uh, ideas that I would have. So it would be correct. I have to teach what the Word says. What thus saith the Lord. Who is this that darkness counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, who are these ignorant people who are trying to counsel? Verse 3. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer thou me. God's always going to come to you and say, I want to speak to you face to face, one on one. One day we're all going to give an account to the Lord for our life. Everything we've done and said, we will give an account to God. We did not go free. Everyone will give an account. Believers will appear at the judgment seat and leave us up the bar of judgment for works. We will give an account of what we're doing in this life. Alright. Now verse 4. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, yes, thou hast it. That's a, that's a heavy question. What the Lord asked you, where, where were you when I created the earth, the stars, the moon, the planets, and all that? Where were you? You wouldn't know. But, but actually, we were with the Lord. We were in his heart and mind. God chose us before the foundation of the world. That's why we that are born again, we have chosen God back. The Bible teaches uh, predestination. Not Calvinism, but predestination. In other words, God predestined us to be elect to receive his blessing and to be born again and live for him. But there are many who do not choose to do that because they chose before the foundation of the world. How and why, I don't know, but they, they reject God and therefore they will not be with God. But it's their own choice. It's their own choice. All right. Okay, verse 5. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fast? In other words, Job, what, what pulled the earth out there? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now, this is what I want you to know here in verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, that's the planet, the stars, and all the spheres, they were worshiping God. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Those are the angels, the created angels. These were creating, they were praising God and shouting at the creation of the earth. They were watching God create the earth, the foundation of the earth, and all the heaven. Now, verse 8, For who shut up the sea with doors, when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? Now in verse 2, you notice when the, the Spirit was brooding over the water, the earth was without form and void, even the earth wasn't even around, it was out of shape. And the water was so perverted and destructive that God had to recreate it, reform it, restructure it, and shape it. He did so. And Jesus was right there, the Father, Jesus, and the Spirit. At that time, Jesus was the Word. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word God was God. And then verse 2 says, And there was nothing made that was made except by Him. And he was the light of men. And the light came into the earth to give light to men. Now, here it says, Who shut up the sea with doors and break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? Here we're looking at continental shifts. We're looking at the earth forming. You can see that coming up out of the water. Before, see, like I said, the earth was completely uh, without blemish and everything. By the way, there was no uh, ocean or seas on the earth at that point in time. If you go over to the book of Revelation, you see again, when God restructures the new heavens and new earth, there will be no ocean. No ocean or sea. There will be lakes, streams, and rivers, but no ocean or sea. There will be more land mass again, like it was originally in the first earth. I'm not talking about the chaotic earth in verse 2. I'm talking about the earth before that, that God originally created. And he created it perfect, and he created it to be inhabited like the rest of the scripture. All right. Now, for who shut up the sea with doors and break forth and issue out of the womb? When 
when I made the cloud a garment, here it is, thereof in thick darkness, a swaddling band for it. So God is talking about that swaddling band. That's why the earth is dark, empty, formless, void. And break up for up for it by a street place and set bars and doors. In other words, God told the water where to be and where to stay and where to move. And by the way, the first flood, he spoke to it and it hasted away. It fled away. Alright, I'm going to just a moment ago and get ahead of myself here. And you break up the street place and set bars and doors. In verse 11, it said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be sustained or held back. So here we see the water is all coming into place. Continents are being shaped and formed, and therefore, this is what God is requiring. Now, all right, let's uh, think here. Kind of went blank there. Turn, turn back to Genesis. Go back here. Now, I told you in verse three on. It's recreation, no saw, restoration. Chapter 2 here, verse 1, Thus the heaven and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day. See, on the seventh day, this is the restoration uh, that God has done. In the Hebrew, it's called uh, Sheba. Shabua, Shabua. The Greek is Sabaton, which means rest, rest. And God is still in that rest. Now, the Greek word for the restoration, recreation, is genon. But in the Hebrew, it is asaf. Now, uh, let's go to Genesis 8. Bear with me. Genesis 8. Okay. Alright. Now, in chapter 8, verse 1. Now, Noah was in the ark. Okay, the waters are still there. God, so right here, verse 1, start with the God reigned every man, and every living thing, all the cattle and the fish of the ark. God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assayed. In other words, gradually abated. The fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. The waters returned from off the earth continually after the year, to the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. So it took 150 days for these waters. Where I told you the flood before, the Spirit was brooding over the waters, and God spoke, and the waters left. It's gone. It's gone. I don't have to explain that, but God did that. Because He was doing a work here, recreating. He removed that swaddling band, the dark band, that's all around the earth, and also which allowed the light for the luminaries, the moon, stars, and the sun. Natural light come back to the earth. Now, and the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of Noah upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month, and the tenth month on the first day of the month, for the tops of the mountains sink. I want to say something. The mountains at this point of time and then were not as big as they are now. And then Noah's flood, the, the waters went well above the mountains and going to the top of the mountains. By the way, what created the mountains? That was again when God was restoring the earth and the continental shift was pushing these mountains back up, pushing them back. Now verse 5, and the waters decreased continually until the tenth month of the tenth month on the first day of the month. So 
the problem of Noah. See, and it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he said, For they raven and the bird raven and the dove, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also he sent forth a dove to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the soul of the foot. And she returned it again into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth, and he put forth his hand and took it and pulled her in unto him to the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days, and she was sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came again to him that evening. And all in her mouth was a smell of the blood dog, so no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days, and it was the seventh, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundred first year, the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up off of the earth, and Noah removed the covering off the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And the second month, or the seventh, the twentieth day of the month, I want to turn over here to Isaiah. Back to Isaiah. Chapter 45, I believe. I'm going to go to Psalm 104. I had to think for a minute. The Holy Spirit helped me out there. Psalm 104, because I want to prove my point here. All right. I want to just start reading the words now. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who covereth thyself with light as the garment. Who stretches out the heaven as like the curtain. See, God is light. He's covered with light. He's absolute light. And I mean by absolute light, there's no darkness in him. Just like in Satan now, now this is what he tells him in Satan. There's no light in him. He's absolute darkness. Okay, who covers thyself with light as the garment and stretches out the heavens like the curtain? Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters? Who maketh the clouds his chariot? Who walketh Upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. Now, notice verse 5 here. Who lays the foundation of the earth that it should not be removed forever. So, see, the earth is never going to actually ever be destroyed. It'll be re renovated many times, but it's never going to be the end. That's like a lot of people think. Well, it's the end of the earth. It's the end of the world. No, it's the end of the age right now, folks. It's about to come. The end of the church age is the day of the Gentiles. Is about to end. Praise the Lord. Now, verse 6. Thou coverest it with deep as with a garment. Well, that proves number verse 2 again. That reveals the one, doesn't it? Thou coverest it with deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountain. Now, here's what I want to show you at verse 7. At thy rebuke, they fled. At the voice of thy thunder, they hasted away. Those waters got up and got on down the road, buddy. They didn't abate gradually like we've seen over there in Genesis 8 of Noah's flood. So we're looking at a different flood here today. Now verse 8. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys, unto the place which thou hast founded for them. This is again continental shift. This is the Holy Spirit brooding over the waters in verse 2. Right there. The Holy Spirit is the Lord and Jesus, the Father and Jesus. Verse 9, Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. And God is in control of all of it. I wanted to show you this, but it proves exactly the two floods. I read to you out of Second Peter chapter 3, about the earth being in the water and out of the water. And yet people still reject all this, reject the truth of God's word. I don't understand why they can't simply understand what God is saying. These waters that were there just got up in that first flood, and God rebuked them, and they were gone. God 
God is God. He can do what he wants when he wants. Amen. Praise the Lord. Why do we not accept that and believe that? Just simply accept God's word and believe and trust him. Amen. Dearly beloved, today, if, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, I pray that you find him today. I pray that you accept Christ into your heart by faith. Because a child before it's eternally too late. You only have the promise of finding Jesus in life on this side of the grave. When you die, if you die in your sin, you perish. The Bible says, except they repent, they shall likewise perish in their sin. You will be eternally lost. And you don't want to do that. You don't want to wind up in the lake of fire. And it is eternal burning there. It's not what people try to teach, but it's going to burn you up at the end of it. See, if a lot of people believe that, they'd live like they want to. And that's why a lot of them believe that way. Because they can live ungodly lives and do whatever they want to do. And they say, well, that's the end of it. Well, no, you know, you leave this body. The Bible says the absence of the body is to be present with the Lord. So therefore, you face judgment. The Bible says it's appointed once for man to die. Take the judgment. So my dear friend, you must believe what God is saying, not what man is trying to teach you. Man's doctrine. Doctrine to teach the devil today. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaks expressively and most strongly in the latter days that some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seduce the spirits and doctrines of demons. Brothers and sisters, I plead with you. Please come to Christ today. And those of you that do know Christ and you need to draw closer to the Lord, please come to Him and draw back. Live for him and serve him. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you receive his name for it's eternally too late. And it's simple. All you have to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to come into my heart and give me eternal life. And I ask you to forgive me of this sin from the past all the way up to the present right now. Lord Jesus, give me that eternal life. And he said in Romans 10 9 and 10, if you will confess him with your mouth, Believe in your heart that God has raised His Son from the dead, Jesus. You shall be saved. So that's how simple it is, my dear friend. And I pray that you do that today and find a place and time. Quiet, do that, and then tell somebody about it. Tell somebody that you just received Christ by faith in your heart. Amen. Now, if you do this, and I would love to rejoice with you if you receive Christ, you can contact me at freddystuck at yahoo.com. Or you can call me at 812-533-9484. I would love to hear from you and rejoice with you. And also send you some materials that will help you in your new walk with the Lord. Now I pray that God give you a blessed, glorious, beautiful day. In Jesus' name, amen.